The Crescent Hotel stood on the outskirts of a small, fog-shrouded town, its once grand facade now weathered by years of neglect. Locals whispered about the place, recalling the eerie tales of those who had vanished within its walls. The hotel had a sinister reputation, known as the most haunted hotel in America, and it drew thrill-seekers and ghost hunters from far and wide. One late October evening, a group of five friends, Emma, Jake, Lily, Mark, and Sarah, decided to book a night at the Crescent Hotel, eager to experience the paranormal activity they had read about. Armed with flashlights, cameras, and an insatiable curiosity, they arrived at the hotel just before dusk. The atmosphere shifted as they approached the entrance. The air felt thick, charged with an unspoken tension. The lobby was dimly lit, the air heavy with the scent of dust and decay. An elderly man behind the front desk greeted them with a toothy grin that seemed a little too wide. Welcome to the Crescent Hotel. I hope you're ready for an unforgettable night, he said, his voice gravelly. They exchanged glances, a mix of excitement and apprehension flooding their senses. After checking in, they were handed an old brass key and directed to room 218, said to be one of the most haunted rooms in the hotel. As they climbed the creaky stairs, shadows danced along the walls and strange whispers seemed to echo around them. Did you hear that? Lily asked her voice trembling slightly. Just the wind, Jake reassured her, though he couldn't shake the unease creeping up his spine. Room 218 was adorned with vintage furniture, but the atmosphere was heavy, as if the walls themselves were holding onto centuries of sorrow. The friends settled in, snapping pictures and joking about what ghostly encounters awaited them. As night fell, they gathered in a circle on the floor, armed with a Ouija board they had brought along, ready to summon the spirits said to linger in the hotel. Is anyone here with us? Emma asked, her voice a mix of bravado and fear. The planchette moved slowly at first, then jerked toward the letters, spelling out a name. Elizabeth. The group exchanged glances, intrigued. Who is Elizabeth? Mark asked, a nervous chuckle escaping his lips. She was a guest here in the 1920s, Sarah explained, having researched the hotel's history. She died under mysterious circumstances. Suddenly, the temperature dropped, and a gust of wind rattled the window. The lights flickered, and a low, mournful wail echoed through the room, chilling them to the bone. They huddled closer together, adrenaline coursing through their veins. Maybe we should stop, Lily suggested, her voice barely above a whisper. No way, this is getting good, Jake urged, a gleam of excitement in his eyes. They pressed on, but the atmosphere had shifted. The planchette moved erratically, spelling out, Help! Panic surged through the group as they exchanged worried glances. Just then, the door creaked open, revealing an empty hallway shrouded in darkness. Did you guys see that? Sarah asked, her voice shaking. It was probably just the wind, Jake insisted, though even he felt a chill race down his spine. As they resumed their session, the lights began to flicker more violently. Suddenly, the planchette shot across the board, landing on, Go away. Okay, I think it's time to end this. Mark said, rising to his feet. This isn't funny anymore. But before anyone could respond, a loud crash echoed from the bathroom, followed by the sound of water running. They all turned to see the bathroom door swinging open, revealing a flickering light above the mirror. What the hell? Jake said, edging toward the door. As he stepped inside, he found the sink filled with murky water, the faucet pouring relentlessly despite having been turned off. A chilling voice echoed in the air, whispering, Leave this place. The friends rushed to Jake, their hearts pounding in their chests. We need to get out of here. Lily screamed, but the door slammed shut behind them, trapping them inside. Panic set in as they banged on the door, but it wouldn't budge. What do we do? Sarah cried, her voice rising in pitch. We have to find another way out. Mark shouted, scanning the room frantically. Suddenly, a shadow moved across the mirror and Emma's blood ran cold as she recognized the figure a woman in a long, flowing gown, her face obscured by dark hair. Elizabeth, Emma whispered, her voice trembling. Help me, the apparition pleaded, her voice echoing in the small bathroom. You must help me find peace. With newfound determination, Emma stepped forward. What do you need us to do? The ghost pointed toward the window, her expression filled with anguish. The truth lies beneath the hotel. You must uncover it. Just then, the door flew open and the friends rushed out into the hallway, panting and terrified. They could hear the wind howling outside, and the entire hotel creaked ominously around them. 
We have to find the truth, Emma insisted, her heart racing. They retraced their steps, making their way down to the hotel's basement, which was rumored to be the site of strange occurrences. The air was thick with dust and the remnants of forgotten memories. In the corner, they found an old trunk, partially buried under debris. What's this? Jake asked, prying it open. Inside were faded photographs and newspaper clippings detailing Elizabeth's tragic story. She had been murdered by a jealous lover, her body hidden beneath the hotel's foundations. As they sifted through the contents, a sudden chill enveloped the room. The lights flickered, and Elizabeth's ghost appeared, her expression one of sorrow mixed with gratitude. You have found the truth. Now I can rest, she whispered, her voice echoing like a distant memory. With a soft smile, she began to fade. Her spirits got finally free from the torment of her past. The temperature rose and the oppressive weight in the air lifted, leaving the friends feeling lighter. The next morning, they checked out of the Crescent Hotel, forever changed by their encounter. They left with a story that would haunt their memories, but also a sense of closure for Elizabeth. As they drove away, they looked back at the old hotel, now bathed in the golden light of dawn. The whispers of the past had faded, but the echoes of their night would linger forever. Story number two. Nestled in the heart of a forgotten town, Ravenswood Hotel had long been a place of whispers and shadows. Its once vibrant facade now faded and cracked. The hotel was known for its luxurious past, but had fallen into disrepair. Yet it still drew a curious clientele. Those seeking a thrill, a brush with the supernatural, or perhaps just a cheap room for the night. The locals knew better, sharing hushed warnings about the spirits that roamed the halls. It was late October when Sarah, a young journalist fascinated by the paranormal, decided to spend the night at Ravenswood. Armed with her notebook and a camera, she was determined to uncover the truth behind the hotel's haunted reputation. As she checked in, the receptionist, a gaunt woman with hollow eyes, seemed reluctant to hand over the key to room 217. You'll want to stay in the common areas after dark, she murmured, casting a wary glance towards the dimly lit hallway. Ignoring the warning, Sarah ascended the creaking staircase, the air growing colder with each step. The walls bore peeling wallpaper adorned with faded floral patterns, and the floorboards groaned under her weight. Room 217 was at the end of the corridor, its door slightly ajar as if inviting her in. She pushed the door open, revealing a small, dusty room with a view of the overgrown garden below. The atmosphere felt heavy as though the room itself were holding its breath. As night fell, Sarah set up her recording equipment, eager to capture any signs of paranormal activity. She switched on her camera, the red light blinking ominously in the gloom. This is Sarah Collins, reporting from Ravenswood Hotel, she began, her voice steady but tinged with excitement. I'm in room 217, where numerous guests have reported strange occurrences, including ghostly apparitions and unexplained noises. The silence of the room was unsettling, broken only by the distant sound of the wind rustling the leaves outside. After a few hours of waiting, she decided to explore the hotel, armed with her flashlight. The corridor was shrouded in darkness, the flickering lights casting eerie shadows on the walls. As she moved deeper into the hotel, the temperature dropped significantly, and she felt an uncomfortable sensation creeping up her spine. She stumbled upon a grand ballroom, its once majestic decor now cloaked in dust and decay. Chandeliers hung like skeletons from the ceiling, and the air was thick with the scent of mildew. As she stepped inside, a chill swept through the room and the doors slammed shut behind her. Heart racing, Sarah rushed to the door, but it wouldn't budge. Panic set in as she realized she was trapped. Suddenly, she heard a soft whisper like a breath on the wind. Help me, please. The voice was weak, filled with despair. Sarah's heart pounded in her chest as she scanned the room, the beam of her flashlight illuminating the empty space. Who's there? She called out, her voice trembling. Help me. The voice grew louder, echoing off the walls. Terrified yet intrigued, Sarah began to record, her hands shaking. Is someone trapped here? She asked, her fear battling with her journalistic instincts. Then, without warning, the lights flickered and went out, plunging her into darkness. The temperature dropped further and Sarah could see her breath in the air. In the dark, she felt a presence, a cold, oppressive weight that enveloped her. Leave this place, a deeper voice growled, sending shivers down her spine. You're not welcome here. Desperately, Sarah pounded on the door, shouting for help. 
The door rattled violently, and she felt a strong force pulling her back, as if the very walls were trying to keep her inside. Just as she thought she might be trapped forever, the door swung open, and she stumbled out into the corridor, gasping for air. She raced back to her room, heart racing, and locked the door behind her. Trembling, she replayed the recording on her camera. As she listened, she could hear her own voice and the faint whispers, but then, distinctly, she heard the chilling words, Help me. I'm trapped. Determined to uncover the truth, Sarah spent the next few hours researching the hotel's history. In the dim light of her room, she discovered that Ravenswood had once been a lavish getaway for the wealthy. However, it also held a dark secret. A tragic fire had broken out years ago during a grand ball claiming the lives of several guests. Among them was a young woman named Eliza, whose spirit was said to linger in the hotel, searching for help. As the clock struck midnight, Sarah felt an overwhelming sense of dread. She decided to confront the spirit, believing that Eliza's unrest was linked to her tragic fate. Gathering her courage, she returned to the ballroom, the air thick with tension. Eliza, she called into the darkness. I'm here to help you. What do you want? For a moment, silence hung in the air, then the whispers began again, swirling around her like a storm. Help me. Find me. With a deep breath, Sarah focused her energy, determined to connect with Eliza. You're not alone, she said, her voice steady. I'm here. Tell me how I can help you. The lights flickered back to life, revealing a figure in a flowing white dress, standing at the far end of the ballroom. Eliza's face was pale, her eyes filled with sorrow and longing. You must uncover the truth, she whispered, her voice echoing through the room. They, they took something from me. What did they take? Sarah asked, her heart racing. Eliza, we will find it together, Sarah promised, feeling an unexpected bond with the spirit. As she spoke, the room began to shimmer, and Sarah felt a warm light enveloping her, guiding her towards a hidden doorway behind a curtain. Together, they pushed through the veil, revealing a dusty, forgotten room filled with forgotten treasures, old jewelry, letters, and a small music box. This is it, Eliza said, her voice a mixture of relief and sorrow. My heart, I never got to say goodbye. Sarah reached for the music box, its intricate design captivating her. As she opened it, a haunting melody filled the air, resonating through the ballroom. The music wrapped around them like a warm embrace, and Eliza began to smile, the sorrow in her eyes lifting. Thank you, Eliza whispered, her form becoming more transparent. Now I can rest. As the final notes of the music faded, Eliza's spirit began to dissolve into the light. Remember me, she breathed, and then she was gone. Sarah stood alone in the ballroom, the warmth of Eliza's gratitude lingering in the air. She had uncovered the truth, and in doing so had helped a lost soul find peace. With a mix of triumph and sadness, she returned to her room, the weight of the night lifting from her shoulders. The next morning, as she checked out of Ravenswood Hotel, the receptionist regarded her with newfound respect. Did you see her? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Yes, Sarah replied, a smile breaking through her weariness. I helped her. With a lingering glance at the decaying hotel, Sarah stepped outside, the sun shining brightly. Ravenswood had shared its secrets, and for the first time in years, it felt alive. Story number three. In a small town, tucked away from bustling highways, stood the Velvet Pines Hotel, an old, creaking building with peeling paint and narrow hallways. The locals whispered about the place, saying some guests never checked out, at least not fully. The staff maintained smiles during the day, but at night their lips tightened, their footsteps quickened in the hallways. No one liked being on duty after dark, and the reason for their unease centered around Room 306. Room 306 had a history. Every few years, someone reported seeing strange things inside. A woman in a red dress reflected in the mirror, the sound of crying behind the walls, or lights flickering even when the room was vacant. One bellboy swore he saw the shower running on its own and quit the next morning, too shaken to even collect his final paycheck. Yet the hotel kept renting the room to anyone curious enough or desperate for a stay. Most people didn't make it past the first night. Ethan was a traveling salesman who had booked a room in the Velvet Pines Hotel that October night. Rain drummed against the windows as he checked in, the lobby dimly lit by old chandeliers that swayed slightly, as if disturbed by a draft. The front desk clerk, a woman with tired eyes and a forced smile, handed him his key without making eye contact. 
Room 306, she murmured. Ethan noticed the sudden change in her demeanor, her hesitation as if she wanted to say more, but the phone rang and she waved him off. He shrugged and made his way to the elevator. The ride up to the third floor was slow and uncomfortable, the elevator groaning under its own weight. When the doors opened, a gust of cool air brushed against Ethan's neck. He tugged his collar higher, blaming the chilly draft on the old building. The hallway stretched ahead, dimly lit by antique sconces on the walls. The carpet was frayed at the edges and the wallpaper curled in the corners, as though the hotel was slowly being consumed by time. As Ethan walked toward his room at the end of the hall, he noticed a distinct silence. No other guests, no chatter from the rooms, not even the hum of a television. Just the hollow sound of his footsteps against the old floorboards. When he reached room 306, Ethan hesitated. The brass numbers on the door seemed to shimmer faintly, and he could have sworn the air felt heavier there, as if the room itself was breathing. Shaking off the strange feeling, he slid the key into the lock and pushed the door open. The room was small and unimpressive. Standard bed, a wooden dresser, a mirror on the wall opposite the bed, and a bathroom in the corner. The window overlooked the street below, where rain blurred the streetlights. Ethan tossed his suitcase onto the bed and sat down with a tired sigh, rubbing the, the back of his neck. After a quick shower, he climbed into bed, intending to sleep off the fatigue of the day. But the moment he closed his eyes, he heard it. A faint tap, 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 as if someone was knocking gently on the window. Ethan sat up, his heart thumping. The window was on the third floor, impossible for anyone to reach. He told himself it was probably just rainwater trickling down the glass and lay back down. Then the knocking came again. Tap, tap, tap. Ethan's skin crawled. He got up and walked to the window, drawing the curtains aside. Nothing. Just the wet night outside. He exhaled in relief and turned back toward the bed, only to freeze in place. In the mirror above the dresser, a woman in a red dress stood behind him. Ethan whipped around, but the room was empty. His heart pounded in his chest as he stared into the mirror again. The woman was gone. His hands trembled as he backed away from the dresser and sat on the edge of the bed, trying to convince himself he was just seeing things. Just tired, maybe a trick of the light. He turned off the bedside lamp and tried to sleep again, but the room would not let him. The air grew thick, oppressive. The bed felt damp and cold, as though it had been soaked in ice water. And then the crying began, soft, distant at first, like a woman sobbing behind a wall. Ethan sat bolt upright, his breath catching in his throat. The sound grew louder, closer, as if the weeping woman was just outside the door. Ethan stared at the doorknob, willing it not to turn, but it didn't need to. A shadow slipped through the gap between the door and the floor, thin, long fingers reaching toward him like they were searching for something. Ethan scrambled off the bed, backing into the corner of the room. His mind raced with panic. The shadow crept closer the sobbing growing louder, almost desperate. He fumbled for his phone to call the front desk, but when he pressed it to his ear, all he heard was static. The door to the bathroom creaked open. Ethan turned toward it slowly, every muscle in his body locked in terror. In the darkness of the bathroom doorway, he saw her, a pale woman in a red dress, her face hidden beneath a curtain of wet black hair. She stood motionless, her head tilted as if listening, and then she stepped forward. Ethan bolted for the door, yanking it open with trembling hands. The hallway outside was empty and silent, but he didn't care. He ran down the corridor, his footsteps echoing loudly and slammed the elevator button repeatedly. The doors finally opened, and he stumbled inside, punching the button for the lobby. As the elevator doors began to close, he saw her again, standing at the end of the hall, her red dress bright against the faded wallpaper. Her head tilted, her black hair clinging to her face, and her lips curled into a thin, knowing smile. The elevator shuddered and descended, but Ethan's heart did not slow until he reached the lobby. He dashed to the front desk, breathless and pale. I can't. Room 306. There's someone, he stammered. The desk clerk's expression darkened. She glanced toward the night manager, who gave a tired sigh. You saw her, didn't you? The clerk whispered, her voice laced with a grim sort of sympathy. What? Ethan gasped. The night manager nodded. The woman in red. She always finds a way into 306. You're not the first, and you won't be the last. Ethan's hands shook as he backed away. What the hell is wrong with that room? 
The night manager stared at him with weary eyes. We don't know who she is, but we know one thing. Once she finds you, she never really leaves. Ethan checked out that very night, vowing never to set foot in the Velvet Pines Hotel again. But as he drove down the lonely road, the rain tapping against his windshield, he glanced in the rearview mirror. And there she was, sitting in the back seat, her red dress glowing softly in the dark. Story number four. Maplewood Inn was a charming, rustic establishment nestled in a serene forest clearing, its wooden beams and gabled roof giving it an inviting, homey feel. But behind its quaint facade lay a history steeped in tragedy and whispers of lingering spirits. The locals rarely spoke of the inn's haunted past, but its reputation drew travelers seeking a blend of nostalgia and adventure. One autumn evening, a young couple, Hannah and Alex, arrived at the inn. They were on a getaway, eager to escape the hustle of city life and bask in the warmth of a cozy retreat. As they entered the lobby, the scent of wood smoke and cinnamon greeted them. The innkeeper, a middle-aged woman named Margaret, welcomed them with a warm smile. Ah, you must be the couple I spoke to on the phone. We have a lovely room for you on the second floor, she said, her voice warm yet slightly tinged with caution. But I must warn you, some guests have reported unusual occurrences. Unusual occurrences? Alex asked, intrigued. Oh, just stories. You know how it goes, Margaret replied with a dismissive wave, though her eyes glinted with something more. If you hear any noises at night, don't be alarmed. It's just the inn settling. Hannah chuckled, brushing it off as local lore, but Alex felt a chill run down his spine. They took their key and climbed the winding staircase, the wood creaking underfoot. Room 212 awaited them, a cozy space adorned with floral wallpaper and a large window overlooking the woods. As night fell, they settled in for a romantic evening, candles flickering softly around the room. After dinner, they snuggled under the covers, sharing stories and laughter. But as the clock struck midnight, a soft tapping echoed through the room. Did you hear that? Hannah asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Probably just a branch against the window. Alex assured her, but he couldn't shake the unease creeping in. The tapping grew louder, turning into a rhythmic knock that sent a shiver down their spines. They exchanged nervous glances before Alex decided to investigate. He tiptoed to the door and opened it, peering into the dimly lit hallway. Nothing. Just silence. See? Nothing to worry about, he said, returning to bed, but the unease lingered. Later that night, Hannah awoke to the sound of soft crying coming from somewhere in the inn. She nudged Alex awake. Do you hear that? Yes, he replied, frowning. It sounds like someone is upset. They both listened intently, the weeping growing louder, echoing through the hall. Compelled by curiosity and concern, they slipped out of bed and followed the sound. As they crept down the hallway, the air grew colder and a sense of dread settled around them. The crying led them to a door at the end of the hall, slightly ajar. Alex hesitated, but then pushed it open, revealing a dimly lit room. Inside, a figure sat hunched over, bathed in moonlight. The couple's hearts raced as they realized it was a woman in a tattered white dress, her hair cascading over her face as she wept into her hands. Excuse me? Hannah called softly, stepping forward. Are you okay? The woman looked up, her eyes filled with sorrow and an otherworldly glow. Help me, she whispered, her voice a haunting melody. I am trapped. Alex and Hannah exchanged glances, a mixture of fear and empathy washing over them. What happened to you? Alex asked, his voice steady despite the chill in the room. I waited for him. He promised to return, but he never did, the ghost said, her voice trembling. He left me here, and now I cannot leave. Who? Who left you? Hannah pressed, her heart aching for the sorrowful spirit. Thomas, the ghost replied, her gaze distant, as if recalling a bittersweet memory. He was my love, but he was taken from me. I am bound to this place, waiting for him to come back. The air grew heavy with despair, and Hannah felt tears welling up in her eyes. We can help you find peace. How can we do that? Find the truth, the ghost implored, her voice fading like a whisper in the wind. You must discover what happened to him. Before they could respond, the ghost dissipated, leaving behind a lingering chill and the echo of her sorrow. The couple stood in silence, heartbeats pounding in their ears. What do we do? Hannah asked, a mix of fear and determination in her voice. We have to find out what happened to this Thomas, Alex replied. Maybe the innkeeper knows something. 
They hurried back to their room and dressed quickly, adrenaline coursing through their veins. They descended the stairs, heading toward the lobby, where Margaret was tidying up. Is everything all right? She asked, noticing their urgency. Can you tell us about Thomas? Alex asked, desperation lacing his tone. Margaret's expression changed, a shadow crossing her face. Thomas, he was a traveler who stayed here many years ago. He vanished one stormy night, and no one ever found him. Did you ever find out what happened? Hannah pressed. No, but some say he went to the old mill near the river and never returned, Margaret said, her voice barely above a whisper. It's a cursed place. Many say it's haunted, too. With a renewed sense of purpose, Alex and Hannah thanked Margaret and headed out into the night, guided by the faint glow of the moon. The path to the old mill was overgrown and treacherous, the trees looming ominously overhead. When they arrived, the mill stood in ruins, its wooden structure creaking in the wind. The air was thick with an eerie stillness, and a sense of foreboding hung heavily around them. Do you think he's really here? Hannah asked, her voice trembling. We have to find out, Alex replied, moving cautiously inside. The interior was dark, filled with the scent of damp earth and decay. As they explored, they stumbled upon a hidden room behind a stack of old crates. Inside, they found a small diary, the pages yellowed with age. This must be his, Alex said, flipping through it. The entries detailed Thomas's struggles and his undying love for the ghost, Elizabeth. One entry sent chills down their spines. I fear for my life. Someone wants to keep me from her. If I don't return, know that I love you, Elizabeth. This is it, Hannah exclaimed. We have to go back and tell her. They raced back to the inn, their hearts pounding in their chests. When they reached room 212, they called out, Elizabeth, we know what happened. The air shimmered, and Elizabeth materialized before them, her expression hopeful yet still tinged with sorrow. Did you find him? Yes, Alex said, holding up the diary. He loved you, but he was taken. You need to let go. He wouldn't want you to suffer. Tears streamed down Elizabeth's cheeks, her ethereal form flickering with the weight of emotion. I waited for so long, I didn't know he was gone. Hannah stepped forward, her voice soothing. You can be free now. He's at peace, and you deserve to be too. As Elizabeth reached out to them, her form glowed brighter, the sorrow lifting from her spirit. Thank you, she whispered, her voice now a gentle breeze. I can finally rest. With that, she began to fade, a look of serene acceptance washing over her face. The room filled with a warm light, and the oppressive weight that had lingered for so long lifted, leaving behind a sense of peace. The couple returned to their room, exhausted but filled with a profound sense of accomplishment. As they drifted off to sleep, they felt a lightness in the air, the hotel's haunting whispers now replaced by the soft rustle of the autumn leaves outside. In the morning, as they packed to leave, Margaret greeted them with a knowing smile. You helped her, didn't you? Yes, Hannah replied, her heart swelling with fulfillment. We found her truth. As they drove away from Maplewood Inn, the sun broke through the trees, illuminating the path ahead. They knew the haunting would linger in their memories, but they also felt grateful for the journey they had taken and the spirit they had set free. Story number five. In a small, secluded town surrounded by thick forests and fog-laden hills, Blackthorn Inn stood as an ancient relic of a bygone era. Its dark wooden beams and cracked stone facade exuded an air of mystery, drawing travelers and adventurers unaware of the unsettling history that loomed within its walls. Locals whispered tales of strange occurrences, disembodied voices, and shadowy figures that flitted through the inn's dimly lit corridors. It was late autumn when Michael, a skeptical historian, arrived at Blackthorn Inn. He had come to document the tales of its haunting, convinced that the stories were merely figments of imagination. The innkeeper, a grizzled man with a weathered face, greeted him with a wary smile. You'll find the rooms quite comfortable, but don't stray too far after dark. The inn has a mind of its own. Michael chuckled at the old man's words, brushing off the warning. He settled into room nine, a quaint space adorned with antique furniture and a large window overlooking the thick woods. As twilight descended, he prepared to conduct interviews with the other guests, determined to uncover the truth behind the inn's sinister reputation. That night, as guests gathered in the common room, the air buzzed with stories of the inn's haunted past. An elderly woman spoke of the spirit of a woman in white who wandered the halls, weeping for her lost love. A group of young travelers recounted eerie experiences, doors slamming shut, 
cold spots in the air, and whispers that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. Michael, taking notes, maintained his skepticism. Ghost stories are just that, stories. People hear what they want to hear, he asserted, though a knot of unease twisted in his stomach as the fire crackled ominously. Later that night, he retired to his room, convinced that he would sleep soundly, the tales of ghosts mere distractions from his research. However, as the clock struck midnight, he was jolted awake by a soft, melodic humming. The sound wafted through the air, sweet and sorrowful, drawing him from his bed. Compelled by curiosity, he followed the sound down the dimly lit corridor. The humming grew louder, guiding him toward the inn's forgotten corners. He crept past closed doors, their surfaces worn and aged, until he reached a narrow staircase leading to the attic. With each creak of the floorboards beneath him, a sense of dread washed over him, but the ethereal voice beckoned him onward. At the top of the stairs, Michael found himself in a dusty attic filled with old trunks, cobwebs, and remnants of the past. The voice, now clearer, sang a haunting lullaby, and he realized it belonged to a figure cloaked in shadow, standing near a window. Who are you? he called, trying to mask his fear. The figure turned, revealing a face both beautiful and tragic, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. I am Elara, she replied, her voice echoing in the empty attic. I have been waiting for someone to listen. Michael's heart raced, skepticism crumbling as he faced the apparition. Waiting for what? For someone to remember my story, she lamented, her gaze piercing through the gloom. I was once the innkeeper's daughter, betrothed to a man who never returned from war. I lost hope, and my spirit has been trapped here ever since. As she spoke, Michael felt a deep sense of empathy. What can I do to help you find peace? He asked, his voice steady despite the chill in the air. Alara pointed to a weathered trunk in the corner. Inside lies the truth of my heart. I need you to find it, to share my story with the world. This only then can I be free. Driven by compassion, Michael approached the trunk, its latch rusted but intact. With a deep breath, he opened it, revealing letters and trinkets from a time long past. Among them was a delicate silver locket, containing a faded portrait of Alara and her beloved. As he held it in his hand, a surge of emotion swept through him. You loved him deeply, he whispered. More than words can express, she replied, her voice tinged with sadness. He was taken from me and so was my chance at happiness. I need my story told so that others may remember. Determined, Michael promised to share her tale with the world. As he placed the locket back in the trunk, he felt a shift in the atmosphere. Alara's expression softened, and a warm glow enveloped her. Thank you, she said, her voice now a gentle breeze. You've given me hope, now I can rest. In that moment, the attic filled with light and Alara began to fade, her spirit finally free. The once haunting lullaby transformed into a soft, echoing harmony that filled the air, a final farewell that resonated deep within Michael's soul. When he returned to his room, he found himself changed. The tales he once dismissed now held profound meaning, and he knew he had a duty to honor Alara's memory. In the days that followed, he wrote diligently, pouring Alara's story onto the pages of his notebook, capturing the essence of her love, loss, and longing. As he checked out of Blackthorn Inn, the innkeeper regarded him with a knowing smile. You found her, didn't you? Michael nodded, feeling a sense of fulfillment. I did, and I'll make sure her story is told. With a heavy heart but lighter spirit, he left the inn, the weight of its haunting history lifted. As he walked away, the whispers of Blackthorn Inn faded into the distance, replaced by a sense of peace. The inn would forever hold its secrets, but now, one soul could finally rest. Story number six. Ashwood Manor stood isolated on a hill, its once grand facade now in ivy and shadow. The townsfolk avoided it, spinning tales of ghostly figures and whispered secrets that floated through the halls. Built in the 1800s by the enigmatic Lord Ashwood, the manor had a history marred by tragedy. It was said that anyone who spent a night within its walls would encounter the restless spirits of its past. When Emily received an invitation to a weekend getaway at Ashwood Manor, she was intrigued. An old college friend, Sarah, had decided to host a reunion there, and despite the ominous reputation of the manor, Emily couldn't resist the allure of the mysterious estate. She arrived on a chilly Friday evening, the sky bruised with impending rain. The group was small, Sarah, Emily, and a few other friends from college, Jake, Mia, and Tom. They greeted each other with warm hugs and laughter. 
the kind that melted away the years and rekindled old friendships. Sarah, with her vibrant energy, led them through the grand entrance, revealing the intricacies of the manor. High ceilings adorned with chandeliers, dark wood paneling, and portraits of somber-faced ancestors watching from the walls. As they settled in, the storm broke outside, the wind howling against the windows. The atmosphere shifted, tension creeping in as they gathered in the parlor. Over mugs of steaming cider, the stories of the manor's past began to flow. I heard that Lord Ashwood lost his family in a tragic fire, Mia said, her eyes wide with excitement. Some say he went mad and still roams the halls at night. Or maybe he's just waiting for someone to join him, Tom quipped, chuckling nervously. Emily rolled her eyes, trying to dismiss the growing unease within her. Come on, it's just an old house, can't be that creepy. But as the night deepened, the air thickened with a sense of foreboding. The wind rattled the windows and shadows seemed to move in the corners of the room. After they retired for the night, Emily lay awake in her room, listening to the house creak and settle. The stories echoed in her mind and she felt an inexplicable pull to the darkness beyond her door. Unable to sleep, she decided to explore. She crept into the hallway, the floorboards groaning beneath her weight. The moonlight spilled through the windows, casting eerie patterns on the walls. She wandered into the main hall, where a large mirror hung, its surface clouded with age. As Emily gazed into it, she noticed something odd, a flicker of movement behind her. She turned quickly, but the hallway was empty. Heart pounding, she returned her gaze to the mirror. There it was again, a shadow darting just out of view. She felt a chill crawl up her spine. Get a grip, she whispered to herself. Just then, she heard a soft sound, a faint melody, almost like a lullaby, drifting through the halls. It was haunting and beautiful, drawing her toward the source. Guided by the melody, Emily followed the sound until she reached a door at the end of the hallway. It was slightly ajar, and as she pushed it open, the music stopped. The room was dark, but she stepped inside, her heart racing with curiosity and fear. The air felt heavy, thick with emotion. As her eyes adjusted, she noticed the room was filled with old toys and trinkets, a child's room, long abandoned. In the corner stood a small rocking chair, and in that moment, it began to rock slowly back and forth, as if someone unseen was sitting there. Hello? Emily called out, her voice trembling. Silence answered her. Just as she was about to retreat, a sudden gust of cold air swept through the room and she heard it. A child's giggle echoing in the darkness. The hair on her arms stood on end. Who's there? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Uh, the giggle came again, followed by the sound of tiny footsteps. Emily backed away slowly, heart racing. Just then, the door slammed shut behind her, plunging her into darkness. Panic surged as she fumbled for the doorknob, but it wouldn't budge. Let me out, she cried, pounding on the door. Suddenly, the room filled with soft light, illuminating the figures of two children, an older girl and a younger boy. They stood side by side, their expressions a mix of sadness and longing. Help us, the girl said, her voice sweet yet sorrowful. We're trapped. What do you mean? Emily asked, fear and empathy battling within her. The boy spoke up, his voice trembling. We need you to remember us. Who are you? Emily pleaded, feeling a sense of urgency wash over her. We were Lord Ashwood's children, the girl replied. We died in the fire and now we cannot leave. Emily's heart sank as the pieces fell into place. I'll help you, she promised. But how? The girl pointed to an old trunk in the corner. Find our things. Remember us. With renewed determination, Emily rushed to the trunk and opened it, revealing a collection of dusty toys, clothes, and a small music box. As she lifted the music box, it sprang to life, playing the haunting lullaby she had heard earlier. The children's faces brightened, and they began to dance, their spirits swirling in the light. Thank you, they cried in unison, their voices intertwining with the melody. The room began to shimmer, the walls fading away, replaced by a vision of a sunny garden filled with laughter. Emily watched as the children played, their faces radiant with joy. Remember us, the girl shouted, and in that moment, Emily felt the weight of their sadness lift. She understood. The children had been forgotten, their story buried under layers of time and sorrow. With a final burst of light, the children faded, leaving Emily alone in the room. The door creaked open and she stepped out, her heart swelling with emotion. 
The following morning, Emily gathered her friends and shared the story of the children, the tragic history of Ashwood Manor. They listened in awe as she recounted her experience, the room filled with a newfound respect for the place. As they prepared to leave, Emily paused at the entrance of the manor. She turned back, feeling a sense of closure. Goodbye, she whispered, knowing she would carry the children's memory with her. As they drove away, the storm had cleared, revealing a bright blue sky. Emily smiled, a weight lifted from her heart. The haunting of Ashwood Manor would linger in her mind, but it was no longer a tale of tragedy. It had transformed into a story of remembrance, a legacy that would be shared for generations to come. Story number seven. Nestled at the end of a winding road, shrouded by towering pines, stood Ravenwood Manor. It was a sprawling Victorian mansion, its once vibrant paint now faded and peeling, and its expansive windows darkened by years of neglect. Rumors of hauntings surrounded the estate, whispering tales of tragedy, betrayal, and restless spirits that had never found peace. For decades, it remained abandoned until a curious group of urban explorers decided to uncover the secrets hidden within its walls. The group, Liam, Jess, Tara, and Ben, arrived at the manor just as dusk began to blanket the sky. Armed with flashlights, cameras, and a shared sense of adventure, they stood before the towering double doors, their hearts racing with excitement and trepidation. Are we really doing this? Tara asked, her voice laced with nervous energy. Absolutely, Liam grinned, pushing the door open with a creak that echoed through the stillness. The air inside was musty, filled with the scent of decay and forgotten memories. Dust motes danced in the beams of their flashlights as they stepped inside. The foyer was grand, adorned with crumbling chandeliers and faded wallpaper depicting scenes of a forgotten era. As they ventured further into the manor, they marveled at the opulence that once defined it. The ornate furniture, the grand staircase spiraling upward, and the portraits of stern-looking ancestors lining the walls, their eyes seemingly following the group. Let's check out the library first, Jess suggested, leading the way down a narrow corridor. The library was vast, with towering shelves filled with dusty books and a massive fireplace at one end. As they explored the room, Ben stumbled upon a hidden door behind a shelf. Hey, look at this, he called, excitement in his voice. The others gathered around as Ben pulled the door open, revealing a narrow staircase descending into darkness. Should we go down? He asked, glancing back at the group. Definitely. This is where the real adventure begins, Liam urged. Tara hesitated, a chill creeping up her spine. What if there's something down there? Something dangerous? It's just an old cellar, Jess reassured her. What's the worst that could happen? With a mix of apprehension and excitement, they descended the creaky steps into the depths of the manor. The air grew cooler, and a faint smell of damp earth filled their nostrils. At the bottom of the staircase, they found themselves in a small, dimly lit chamber, the walls lined with cobwebs and the floor littered with debris. In the center of the room stood an old wooden table covered in dust, with strange symbols etched into its surface. As they approached, an inexplicable sense of foreboding enveloped them. What do you think these symbols mean? Liam wondered, tracing a finger over the carvings. I don't know, but they look like some kind of ritualistic markings, Tara replied, her voice trembling. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed through the chamber, startling them. The door they had entered through slammed shut, trapping them inside. Panic surged through the group as they rushed to the door, but it wouldn't budge. Great, now we're stuck. Ben exclaimed, his voice rising in panic. Calm down, everyone. Let's just think this through, Jess said, trying to keep her composure. She turned her flashlight toward the wall, searching for another exit. As the beam of light swept across the room, it illuminated a shadowy figure standing in the corner. Who's there? Jess shouted, her heart pounding in her chest. The figure remained silent, its outline flickering like a candle flame. Slowly, it began to move closer revealing the ghostly visage of a woman clad in a tattered gown, her eyes hollow and filled with sorrow. Help me, the specter whispered, her voice echoing through the chamber. You must help me find my child. Fear gripped the group as they backed away, but the ghost continued to approach, her expression pleading. I have been trapped here for years, searching for my lost son. He was taken from me. What happened to him? Liam asked, his voice trembling. The Dark One came for him. The ghost said, her gaze distant. I failed to protect him, and now I am cursed to wander these halls forever. Tara's heart ached for the spirit. 
How can we help you? She asked gently. Find him, before it's too late, the ghost implored. Her form flew very air around her was charged with sorrow. Just then, the temperature dropped, and a low, rumbling growl echoed through the chamber, shaking the walls. The ghost recoiled, her eyes wide with fear. He's coming! With renewed urgency, the group began searching the room for any clues that might lead them to the child. As they rummaged through the debris, Ben found a small wooden box hidden beneath the table. He opened it, revealing a delicate locket inside, tarnished with age. Look at this, he exclaimed, holding it up for the others to see. The ghost's eyes widened. That belongs to my son. You must return it to me. As she reached for the locket, the growl grew louder and the atmosphere thickened with dread. Hurry, the ghost urged. You must escape. With a burst of adrenaline, Liam shoved against the door and it finally gave way, swinging open. The group stumbled into the hallway and the ghost followed closely behind, guiding them as they raced through the dimly lit manor. Where do we go? Jess shouted, panic evident in her voice. Upstairs, to the nursery, the ghost cried, her voice echoing through the halls. They sprinted up the stairs, the growling now sounding closer, more menacing. The portraits on the walls seemed to leer at them, shadows dancing in the corners of their vision. Finally, they reached the nursery, a small room filled with faded toys and crumbling furniture. The ghost floated toward an old cradle in the corner, her expression filled with desperation. Please, return the locket to me, she pleaded. As she spoke, the room grew darker, and a chilling presence loomed over them. The air crackled with energy, and a shadowy figure emerged from the darkness, its form twisted and grotesque. Leave now, it snarled, its voice a low growl. This is my domain. Terrified, the group huddled together, but Tara stepped forward, clutching the locket tightly. No, we won't let you take her. With a defiant shout, she threw the locket at the ghost, and it passed through the shadowy figure, striking the wall behind it. The ghost caught the locket, her expression transforming from despair to relief. Thank you, she whispered, her voice filled with gratitude. You have freed me. The dark figure let out a furious roar, its form twisting and writhing. You cannot escape. This is my place. The ghost turned to the group, her face serene. Now, you must go. I will protect you. With a sudden burst of light, the shadowy figure dissipated, leaving behind an echo of rage that faded into silence. The room brightened, and the ghost smiled softly at them. You have saved us both. With that, the ghost began to fade, her form shimmering like mist in the morning light. Thank you, she whispered one last time before disappearing completely. As the first rays of dawn streamed through the windows, the group stood in the nursery, breathless and overwhelmed. The oppressive atmosphere of the manor lifted, replaced by a sense of calm and closure. They made their way back down the stairs, the manor now quiet and serene. Stepping outside, they felt the warmth of the sun on their faces, a stark contrast to the chill that had once enveloped them. Did that really just happen? Ben asked, shaking his head in disbelief. It did, Liam replied, a smile breaking through the shock. We helped her find peace. As they drove away from Ravenwood Manor, they looked back one last time, feeling the weight of their experience settle within them. The mansion, once a haunting presence, now stood as a monument to the stories it held and the spirits that had been freed. In that moment, they knew that the echoes of Ravenwood Manor would stay with them forever, a reminder of the power of compassion and the importance of letting go. Story number eight. The old Marlow Manor loomed over the town of Eldridge, its crumbling stone walls and overgrown gardens serving as a reminder of its former glory. The townsfolk avoided the manor, believing it to be cursed, and tales of its tragic history were whispered in hushed tones. It was said that the spirit of Lady Isabella Marlowe, who had vanished on the eve of her wedding a century ago, still wandered the halls, searching for her lost love. Evelyn, a young woman with a penchant for adventure and an insatiable curiosity about the supernatural, decided to explore the infamous manor. Armed with nothing but a flashlight and her notebook, she approached the weathered front door, which creaked ominously as she pushed it open. Dust motes danced in the air, and a musty smell filled her nostrils as she stepped inside. The grand foyer was a haunting sight, with a cracked mirror hanging crookedly on the wall and an elegant chandelier that had long lost its luster. Evelyn took a moment to soak in the atmosphere before venturing deeper into the house, each step on the creaky wooden floor sent a shiver down her spine, but she pressed on, 
eager to uncover the secrets hidden within the manor's walls. As she wandered through the dimly lit rooms, she felt an unsettling presence. The air grew colder, and the shadows seemed to shift around her. In one room, she discovered a dusty piano, its keys yellowed with age. As she brushed her fingers over the keys, a single note echoed through the silence, startling her. The sound reverberated in the stillness, and she felt an electric charge in the air. Is anyone there? She called, her voice trembling slightly. The only answer was the soft creaking of the floorboards. Determined, Evelyn moved on, exploring the library filled with old books and yellowed letters. She sifted through the pages, searching for anything that might reveal the story of Lady Isabella. Finally, she found a brittle journal, its leather cover cracked and faded. The pages were filled with Isabella's elegant handwriting, detailing her life, her love for a man named Thomas, and the preparations for her wedding. But as she read on, the tone shifted. Isabella wrote of strange occurrences leading up to her disappearance, whispers in the night, shadows moving in the corners of her vision, and an overwhelming sense of dread that loomed over her. The last entry was a frantic plea. I fear for my life. Someone wants to keep me from my love. Uh, I must find a way to escape. A chill ran down Evelyn's spine. She felt a sudden rush of sympathy for the young woman who had been trapped in this house, her spirit lingering long after her tragic fate. As she closed the journal, she heard a soft, melodic humming drifting from the direction of the grand staircase. Following the sound, Evelyn climbed the stairs, her heart racing. The humming grew louder, resonating in the empty hallways. At the end of the corridor, she found a door slightly ajar. She pushed it open to reveal a beautifully decorated bedroom, untouched by time. The sunlight poured in through the tall windows, illuminating a wedding dress hanging in the corner, a gown that had turned yellow with age. As she stepped inside, the humming stopped. Evelyn's breath caught in her throat as she noticed a shimmering figure standing by the window. It was Lady Isabella, ethereal and radiant, her eyes filled with sorrow. Who are you? Evelyn asked, her voice barely a whisper. I am Isabella, the spirit replied, her voice soft and haunting. I have been trapped here for too long, waiting for my beloved to return. I cannot leave this place until my story is told. Evelyn's heart ached for the lost soul before her. I found your journal. I want to help you. What happened to you on your wedding day? Isabella's gaze turned wistful. On the eve of my wedding, I was visited by a dark figure. He warned me that my love would never come to claim me. I felt his presence in every corner of this house. I was terrified. In my panic, I ran into the woods, but I never found him again. The forest swallowed me whole, and I have been here ever since. Moved by Isabella's tale, Evelyn felt a surge of determination. We need to find Thomas. Maybe he's been searching for you all these years. Isabella's face brightened for a moment, but that then her expression darkened. It has been so long, I fear he may be lost to time, just like me. Let's not lose hope, Evelyn urged. If you tell me more about him, I might be able to help you find him. With a gentle nod, Isabella shared details about Thomas, a kind-hearted man with a passion for poetry. He would often write me letters, and one was hidden in the attic. It may reveal where he went, she said, her voice filled with longing. Evelyn felt a sense of purpose wash over her. I'll find it. She rushed out of the bedroom and headed for the attic, her heart pounding with excitement and fear. The attic was dark and filled with cobwebs, but she quickly located a pile of old boxes. She began to sift through them, searching for anything that might lead her to Thomas. After what felt like hours, she uncovered a small, ornate box. Inside lay a collection of letters, yellowed with age, and among them, one stood out. It was addressed to Isabella, written in Thomas's unmistakable handwriting. With trembling hands, she opened the letter and began to read. My dearest Isabella, it began. If you are reading this, it means that I could not return for our wedding. I have uncovered something terrible about the man who wishes to possess you. I am doing everything I can to protect you. Stay strong and wait for me. I will find you, my love. Tears streamed down Evelyn's cheeks as she realized the truth. Thomas had fought against whatever dark force had threatened Isabella, but it had cost him dearly. With newfound resolve, Evelyn returned to Isabella in the bedroom. I found Thomas's letter. He loved you deeply and was trying to protect you she said, her voice filled with emotion. Isabella's eyes sparkled with hope. Then, there is still a chance. 
Yes, but we need to break the curse that binds you to this place. Let's call on Thomas together. Can you show me where he might have gone? With a nod, Isabella took Evelyn's hand, and together they ventured back to the attic. They found a small mirror hanging on the wall, covered in dust. This mirror was a gift from Thomas, Isabella said, her voice trembling. It was said to connect our souls. Evelyn grasped the mirror, feeling its energy surge through her. Let's call for him, together. As they stood before the mirror, Evelyn closed her eyes, feeling the air grow heavy around them. Uh, Thomas, we seek you. Please hear us, she cried. The room filled with a brilliant light and the air crackled with energy. Suddenly, a figure appeared in the mirror, a handsome man with gentle eyes and an air of determination. Isabella, he exclaimed, reaching out toward her. Tears filled Isabella's eyes as she stepped closer. I never stopped waiting for you, Thomas. I have been searching for you, he replied, his voice filled with emotion. I knew you were in danger. I'm here now. The light enveloped them, and Evelyn watched in awe as the figures of Isabella and Thomas intertwined, their spirits merging. A sense of peace radiated through the room, and the oppressive atmosphere that had hung over Marlowe Manor began to lift. As the light faded, Evelyn felt a warmth in her heart, knowing she had played a part in reuniting the lost lovers. The room, once filled with sorrow, now felt alive with love. When she returned to the foyer, the sun was beginning to rise, casting a golden glow over the manor. Evelyn stepped outside, feeling the weight of the world lift from her shoulders. The spirits of Isabella and Thomas were finally free, and the haunted past of Marlowe Manor had been laid to rest. As she walked away from the manor, she felt a sense of fulfillment. She would share their story, ensuring that the love between Isabella and Thomas would never be forgotten. Story number nine. In the heart of a once bustling city, nestled between crumbling buildings and overgrown weeds, stood the old Westfield Asylum. Abandoned for decades, it had become a local legend, whispered about in hushed tones. Children dared each other to approach its iron gates, while adults warned their own to stay far away. The tales spoke of the tormented souls who roamed the halls, seeking solace for their unending suffering. When Clara, a budding journalist, learned of the asylum's haunting past, her curiosity was piqued. She had always been fascinated by the stories of the lost and forgotten, and she decided that a night spent in Westfield would make the perfect feature for her upcoming article. Equipped with her camera and a notebook, Clara arrived at the asylum just as dusk painted the sky with hues of purple and orange. The building loomed above her, its gothic architecture both eerie and captivating. She pushed open the creaking iron gates, the sound echoing through the empty courtyard. As she walked toward the entrance, she felt an unsettling chill in the air, but her determination pushed her forward. Inside, the air was stale, and the scent of mildew hung heavily. Clara switched on her flashlight, its beam cutting through the darkness. The walls were lined with peeling paint and faded photographs of the patients who had once wandered the halls. As she explored, Clara felt a presence behind her, a weight that pressed against her back. She turned quickly but saw nothing. Just your imagination, she muttered to herself, forcing a smile as she documented her surroundings. As she ventured deeper into the asylum, she stumbled upon the ward for the severely mentally ill. The rooms were small and dark, with rusted beds and frayed restraints that hung limply from the walls. Clara's heart raced as she imagined the despair that had filled this space. She snapped photos, eager to capture the haunting beauty of the place. Then she heard it, a faint whisper, a soft call that seemed to echo through the corridors. Help? Us? Clara's breath caught in her throat. She brushed it off as the wind playing tricks, but the voice lingered in her mind. Determined to uncover the asylum's secrets, she followed the sound, her flashlight flickering as she navigated the dim hallways. The whispers grew louder, guiding her to a heavy door marked Isolation Ward. Clara hesitated. The door appeared ancient, as if it hadn't been opened in years, but her curiosity won over her fear. She grasped the handle, the metal cold against her skin, and pushed it open. Inside, the room was shrouded in darkness, the only light coming from her flashlight. She stepped in cautiously, scanning the space. Old restraints and medical equipment lay scattered, forgotten remnants of a cruel past. The air felt thick, charged with a sense of despair. Help us. The voice was clearer now, echoing from the shadows. Clara's heart raced as she could step forward. 
Who's there? She called, her voice trembling. A figure emerged from the shadows, a woman, her long hair matted, her clothes tattered and stained. Her eyes were wide with fear and desperation. Please help us, she cried, reaching out toward Clara. Clara stepped back, confusion flooding her mind. What happened to you? We are trapped, the woman gasped, her voice filled with anguish. We were abandoned, left to suffer. You must free us. What do you mean? Clara asked, her heart pounding. How can I help you? The woman pointed toward the far wall, where an old chest sat, half buried under dust and debris. The key, it holds our freedom. Clara approached the chest, her hands trembling as she brushed away the layers of dust. It was locked tight, its surface worn with age. I don't have a key, she exclaimed, frustration bubbling up inside her. Look deeper, the woman urged, her voice growing fainter. You must find it. Clara frantically searched the room, her eyes darting around for anything that could resemble a key. As she rummaged through the scattered papers and debris, she felt a sudden surge of energy behind her. She turned to see the woman again, but now she was joined by other figures, ghostly apparitions, each bearing the same expression of sorrow. We need to be remembered, one man said, stepping closer. Our stories must be told. Clara's heart ached for them. I will. I promise I'll tell your stories. Just tell me how to help you. The key is hidden within our stories, the woman said, her voice now a whisper. You must listen. As the spirits began to share their tales, Clara felt a connection forming, their memories flooding her mind. She saw flashes of their lives, painful treatments, isolation, the cries for help that had gone unheard. She understood then the key was not a physical object, but the truths they had been denied. With newfound determination, Clara took out her notebook and began to write, capturing their stories with every word. She felt the energy in the room shift, the weight of their anguish lifting as she documented their lives. The spirits hovered closer, their expressions softening, as if her words were giving them strength. Finally, as she wrote the last line, a warm light filled the room and Clara felt a wave of peace wash over her. The spirits smiled, their forms becoming lighter, more ethereal. Thank you. They whispered, their voices harmonizing in gratitude. You have set us free. With that, the spirits faded, leaving Clara alone in the dim room. She sank to her knees, overwhelmed by emotion. The chest creaked open, revealing a collection of personal belongings, letters, trinkets, and photographs. Clara carefully gathered them, understanding that they were symbols of their lives and their stories. As dawn broke outside, casting a golden light into the asylum, Clara emerged, carrying the weight of their stories with her. She had come seeking a thrill, but she left with something far more profound. Clara vowed to honor the spirits of Westfield Asylum by sharing their stories with the world. Her article would not just be about the haunted past of the asylum, it would be a testament to the lives that had been lost and forgotten, a tribute to the souls who had finally found peace. In the years that followed, Clara became a voice for the voiceless, her words illuminating the stories of those who had suffered in silence. Westfield Asylum transformed from a place of fear into a site of remembrance, where the echoes of the past served to remind others of the importance of compassion and understanding. Story number 10. The coastal town of Windmere was a picturesque haven with its sandy beaches and charming cottages. At overlooking the tumultuous sea stood the old lighthouse, long abandoned and weathered by time. Its bright white paint was now faded and chipped, and the towering structure was shrouded in stories of ghostly sightings and eerie happenings. Emily, a young journalist with a knack for uncovering the truth, had always been drawn to the lighthouse's haunting beauty. She decided to spend a weekend there, hoping to unravel the mystery that surrounded it. As she packed her gear, she felt a mixture of excitement and apprehension. The locals had warned her to stay away, insisting that the lighthouse was cursed, haunted by the ghost of a lighthouse keeper who had perished in a storm decades ago. Ignoring the warnings, Emily arrived at the lighthouse just as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple. The air was thick with salt and the promise of adventure. As she stepped inside, the door creaked open, revealing a dusty interior filled with the scent of mildew. The spiral staircase wound upward, leading to the lantern room at the top. Determined to explore, Emily set up her camera and began documenting her surroundings. The first few hours were filled with excitement as she captured the decaying beauty of the lighthouse, from the rusted lanterns to the crumbling walls. 
But as night fell, a sense of unease began to creep in. Sitting in the lantern room, she reviewed her photos, the soft hum of the ocean below lulling her into a false sense of security. Suddenly, a loud thud echoed through the lighthouse, jolting her from her thoughts. Heart racing, she grabbed her flashlight and ventured down the staircase, the beam of light flickering as she descended into the darkness. Hello? She called out, her voice trembling slightly. The only response was the sound of the wind howling outside and the waves crashing against the rocks below. As she reached the bottom, she noticed a faint light flickering through a small window. She approached, peering out into the night. Below, she could see the crashing waves illuminated by the moonlight, but something else caught her eye. A figure standing at the edge of the cliff. Is someone there? Emily called out, but the figure didn't move. It was shrouded in shadow, its features obscured by the darkness. The figure remained still, and Emily felt a chill run down her spine. She decided to investigate further, slipping out the back door and making her way toward the cliff. As she stepped onto the rocky ground, she called out again, Hello? Are you okay? Just then, the figure turned to face her, revealing a man dressed in old-fashioned clothing, a long coat flapping in the wind. His face was pale, and his eyes were deep-set, filled with sorrow. I'm sorry, he said, his voice barely audible over the crashing waves. I didn't mean to startle you. Emily took a cautious step forward, intrigued yet wary. Who are you? What are you doing here? I am the keeper of this lighthouse, he replied, his gaze drifting toward the ocean. I have been waiting for so long. For what? She asked, her curiosity peaked despite the unease settling in her stomach. For her, he whispered, a tear rolling down his cheek. My beloved, she was lost at sea during the storm. I never found her. Emily's heart ached at the anguish in his voice. I'm so sorry, but how can I help you? He turned to her, his eyes piercing through the darkness. You must listen to the waves. They carry her voice, her whispers. Confused yet compelled, Emily nodded. She stood by the cliff's edge, focusing on the rhythmic crashing of the waves against the rocks below. As she listened, she began to hear a faint melody, a haunting tune that resonated within her. It was beautiful yet sorrowful, echoing the pain of loss. Do you hear her? The keeper asked, his voice trembling. Yes, Emily whispered, her eyes welling with tears. I can hear her. The keeper smiled sadly. She calls to me, but I cannot reach her. I am bound to this place, forever waiting. In that moment, Emily realized that the keeper was trapped in his grief, unable to move on. She felt a surge of empathy and determination. You don't have to wait anymore. She wouldn't want you to suffer like this. I cannot leave, he replied, anguish etched across his face. I am tied to this lighthouse, to my duty. Your duty was to protect her, Emily said gently. But you can honor her memory by living. You must let her go. The keeper hesitated, his expression shifting from despair to hope. Can I really let her go? Yes, Emily affirmed. But you have to want it. You have to be willing to release your pain. With a deep breath, the keeper closed his eyes, the wind whipping around them. I, I want to be free. The melody grew louder, enveloping them both. The waves crashed violently against the cliffs, and for a moment it felt as if the sea itself was responding to his words. Emily watched in awe as the figure began to shimmer, his sorrow slowly lifting like morning mist. Thank you, he whispered, his voice barely audible as he began to fade. Thank you for helping me find peace. As he disappeared into the night, the haunting melody faded, leaving Emily standing alone at the cliff's edge. The weight of sorrow that had filled the air lifted, replaced by a profound sense of tranquility. She felt an overwhelming sense of connection to the lighthouse and its keeper, as if the very essence of the place had transformed. Returning to the lighthouse, Emily climbed back to the lantern room, a sense of calm washing over her. She sat down, reviewing her photos once more, and noticed something extraordinary. In the corner of one of the pictures was a faint glowing light, a shape that resembled the keeper standing at the cliff's edge. Her heart raced as she realized that the lighthouse was no longer a place of despair. The whispers that had haunted it for so long were now filled with gratitude and love. Emily knew she had witnessed something profound, something that would forever change the way she viewed the world. As dawn broke, casting golden rays across the ocean, Emily packed her gear, feeling a sense of closure wash over her. The lighthouse stood tall and proud against the morning light, a symbol of hope and redemption. 
Driving away from Windmere, she looked back at the lighthouse, now bathed in the warmth of the rising sun. She felt a deep appreciation for the stories that lingered within its walls and a promise to honor the memory of the keeper and his beloved.